All right, hello everyone. I wanted to uh, cover this um, PowerPoint over adaptation. I posted it last week, um, but and we looked at smoke um, and read Augie Wren's Christmas Story. And this week we're going to dive into a larger work, a play titled Doubt by John Patrick Shanley, and um, compare that that um, play, some of those scenes, to how it was then adapted for the film. Now what's interesting about this week's film, it's the only example that we have of this this semester, where the writer of the original source material also directed the film version of it. And so um, certainly you would trust you know that artist's adaptation of his own work, but I think as you read the play, doubt and then watch some of the scenes, I think I posted five or six scenes, um, you're going to notice some differences. And there are a number of different ways to look at adaptation and adaptation studies, one being that um, you can compare and contrast the specific plot points and specific um, details of the work. That's one interesting way to look at adaptation. But for me, I love looking at how film language and the artistic choices of the filmmakers connect with the themes and artistic choices of the authors of the original source material. So, when we're talking about adaptation, we can ask a few interesting questions. One, does it? what does it mean to be faithful to a work of literature or to capture its spirit? Um, we've all seen, I'm sure, adaptations of books that we love. Some of those we might have really enjoyed, uh, thought that they accurately represented the original source material. Others um, we might have seen and that let us down, and we were disappointed by those decisions that the filmmakers made. So what does that mean to you for something to be faithful? Um, often, in t often in film, screenwriters adapt the plots and they change the endings or they shift the emphasis of the literature from which they're working. Now, that can be sometimes good decisions to make. That can sometimes be problematic. There's a really famous example of this uh, from a book called The Natural by Bernard Malamud. And this is a story about baseball in the early uh, part of the 20th century. And um, in the movie with, um, with Robert Redford, he's an aging baseball player. He gets up for his final at-bat hits a home run, it, the ball kind of slowly goes into the air as he hits it, it hits some lights, it sparks the lights, it's a real triumphant moment, um, and the music swells, and Robert Redford's running around the bases, and everyone's happy. <laughs> That's the end of the movie, The Natural. In the book, The Natural, he breaks his precious bat that he whittled out of a tree that was struck by lightning and that final bat you know that final at bat he breaks his bat he strikes out at the end of the of the novel he's in the outfield of the baseball stadium burying that bat it's a very depressing ending the filmmakers went in a completely different direction um and that's not the only case now what are the rights to the original author not that much <laughs> to be honest i think once a book is purchased the author is out of the um, generally out of the out of the production of the film. Um, are there limits to how much something can be changed or should be changed? And I think um, certainly we see some examples of that. Now, why adapt books? They offer a ready-made plot. They um, come to a screen with an with an audience. People want to see those because they've read the book. And it's interesting, but three out of every four Academy Awards for Best Picture have gone to different adaptations. Now, when we talk about adaptation, we can talk about that implicit and explicit meaning. We've been talking about this all semester, form and content. Of course, uh, the story is going to be the explicit message. It's the plot. It's the characters. It's the setting. Uh, the what. And then the discourse is going to be those messages or those ideas buried within. Uh, the theme, the big idea about life, the how, the implicit um, message. Literature has uh, something that I call an unfixed or unspecified language. And that's the joy of reading. 
When we read a sentence like the tree stood in front of the house where I used to live, each one of us might have a different idea about what that tree looks like, how tall, how old, what, what, what kind of tree it is, um, how far is it from the house, what season is it. Some of those might be, you know, personal connections we have to trees in front of houses, but our mind can explore that and our mind can make that up. Verbal language is generally unfixed and unspecified. Certainly some authors are very specific in their setting or in their details. But even in those specific details, we still have some imagination that we use to create what those things look like. Film, on the other hand, is very fixed. If there was a tree in front of a house, we would see the tree in front of the house. And in that way, it's not as specific. Or excuse me, it is it is more specific than than literature. Um, we're constantly overloaded with sens sensory language, sound, light, visual. All of those things flood over us when we watch a film, and we have we get to use less of an imagination um, to create those ideas. You know, for example, if we were reading a novel. And we came to the point in the novel where we saw two friends who had been friends for a long time, um, kind of having their final moment together. Uh, they're in the middle of an argument and they are going to go their separate ways. Uh, let's say this happens in an office where they go their separate ways. Now, just saying that to you, the office is going to look different where the friends are standing are going to be looking different, is going to be looking different between all of us because it's unspecific. Maybe it looks in film something like this. Huh. Citizen Kane, I told you we weren't going to leave it behind. <laughs> but here we see the moment, one of my favorite moments in the film, where uh, Susan's performed at the opera. She's done a horrible job, and Kane is going to finish the review. And this is where he and his good friend, um, Jebediah, go their separate ways. And the way this is shot is absolutely stunning for me. We have Cain in the foreground, Jebediah in the midground there, behind the kind of gate between the office. We see they're placed almost in separate rooms, um, highlighting their the fact that they are not as close as they used to be and that there's something between them now literally between them and then of course we have bernstein back in the window always somebody far back in the window in this movie um so the visual images provide information for us and they don't allow us to use our imagination quite like literature does um you know f words are multi-dimensional they have denotation connotation they can be literal they can be figurative but film works on on five different tracks. We have the acting performances, the words that are spoken or written, the music, the sound effects, and then cinematography aspects, things that we've been looking at throughout the semester. Those are some things to think about, the differences between the written word and film. Now, just to quickly review a few things, I'm sure you know this from your literature classes, there are different fiction elements that we look at when we're uh, thinking about literature. Plot setting, characters, point of view, and theme. The plot are, is the events of a story, and how those events are told can be interesting. Sometimes they're told chronologically, in time order. Sometimes we might get some flashbacks. There are conflicts, you know, internal and external conflicts. I think we've seen um, those in certainly Citizen Kane, but the things that we're going to read in this half of the semester, you'll see characters with internal conflicts and also external ones. The climax, the greatest moment of tension. Now, a setting. I love stories with setting. In settings in the um, work that we're going to be reading for this week, Doubt, are pretty interesting. Uh, the setting is the where, it's the when, and it's the weather. What can setting do? What can it illuminate character? It can certainly set the mood for a story in terms of how it feels. It can be an antagonist or provide conflict, and it can embody theme. It can, it can make us think about those big ideas about life. The story, the play that we're reading, uh, for this week is Doubt by John Patrick Shanley, and it's a story of a priest 
and a nun in a 1960s Catholic school. Um, if we saw the play, which this was, we would see the nun's office. We might see uh, a few other settings. Uh, there's a garden in this play that's, that's particularly powerful for me. And that would be designed for us on stage. If we were reading it, we might design it in our head. When we watch it, when we watch the film, we get to see exactly what the filmmakers want us to see. And I think the settings in this play are used in these various ways as well. To set the mood, to tell us about character, and certainly to point us towards theme. Now, characters are an imagined story, people who inhabit a story. And characterization are moments where we find out who somebody is. Motivation is rationale for behavior, and traits are how we behave. Um, one more thing I, I would think about with character as we read literature in this half of the semester is generally there is a dynamic character, a character who learns or grows or changes in some particular way. And there are interesting ones to follow because they oftentimes connect to that theme idea. The change that happens in the character connects to the big idea about life that the story wants to express. And in doubt, I think we do have a dy dynamic character, a character who learns or grows or changes. Um, point of view is who's telling us the story. This, in a play, this is going to be a bit different. But uh, if we were reading a novel, we were talking about first person or second person or third person point of view. Uh, first person is the I perspective. I went to the store. I bought a candy bar. The third person is the outside perspective. He went to the store. She went to the store. She bought a candy bar. Theme, we know what theme is. We talked about theme with Citizen Kane. It's the big idea about life. It's what the story wants to express. It's the shadow that the story casts. And um, it's what all the events add up to. Okay, now for this week, like I said, we're reading Doubt. It's a really wonderful, wonderful play. I would encourage you to read the um, author's notes in the beginning. Um, I've provided a PDF copy of this for you to read. And there's a reading response for the assignment as well as five different scenes to watch. Now this is a story about 1960s in the Bronx, like I said, a Catholic school, a nun and a priest who are butting heads against something that the priest, priest is accused of doing. In the play, we never get a chance to meet the um, young students in the, in the play. Whereas the play only has four characters. In the film, we do get to meet these students, and in particular the student at question, Donald Muller. So as you're reading the play, what does that lack of students do? The fact that we never get to meet these students who are being discussed. And in a movie, what does that addition do? What do those added characters do? Um, of course, there are also the performances that we get to take a look at. And in the movie version, there are some phenomenal actors. Meryl Streep, Amy Adams, uh, Philip Seymour Hoffman. And um, we can examine those performances and determine whether or not they represent the characters as they're written in the play. Um, I think the final thing I'll say about Doubt, which is really interesting to me, is, as you can probably imagine, there's going to be a bit of Doubt <laughs> in, this, in this story. And one of the things... Uh, that I'm always fascinated by is the truth behind the accusations of Father Flynn. I was listening to an interview with Philip Seymour Hoffman years ago, and he was asked whether or not he had a good sense of if Father Flynn was guilty of, of what he had been accused of. And he said he had many conversations with the director and the writer of this um, and knew some background information that helped him make his acting decisions. And the interviewer said, did Meryl Streep know this information? And uh, uh, Philip Seymour Hoffman said, no, how could she? She's playing this other character who's accusing my character. She can't know what I know. Only I can know what I know. And so it's such an interesting acting decision to know something um, as a character that other characters don't. I find those, those kind of moments fascinating. And I wish I could have been a fly on the wall with the discussion between John Patrick Shanley and, pa and Philip Seymour Hoffman when they were discussing this. Enjoy the scenes, enjoy the play this week, uh, and we'll continue our ad adaptation work as the semester continues. All the best!